welcome to this PISA talk about faults in hydrogeology. This is work I've been doing with Bill Power over the last few years, and the talk in particular is lessons and things we've seen from how faults are not operated into environmental impact statements for the unconventional oil and gas industry. We had a few technical issues in the live session, so I've re-recorded this. So if you see changes, um, there are a few minor changes. Now, I guess one of the things is I'm going to say some things that people don't like, and I would say or pox on all the houses. Uh, science is not about consensus. Science is about working out where we've got things wrong and moving on together. So if I say something that offends someone, I'm sorry. Um, I assume that everyone working in the sciences is trying to do their best job. Um, but there's no statute of limitation on what we say, and our whole job as scientists is to find faults with each other's work. Bill and I have gone out of our way to publish work where we publish all of the information. So if you don't like it, then go for it. You can find where we've got it wrong. So please, you know, tell me I'm wrong. Um, that's how we all have to work. And when I say pox on all their houses, I think we have an intrinsic problem with uh, how government uh, consultancies and green groups are pushing around ideas and concepts about groundwater and major projects. I just sat down and watched Gasland again and could just see where we've got a real problem of people not trusting the system. Now, as scientists, we can work on this and we can point it out. So, again, a pox on all the houses isn't meant to be an insult to people, but it's a call to arms for us actually to do a better job. Now, as an example of things we're dealing with, this is actually from a newspaper article in the Newcastle Herald, explaining about coal seam gas and the Gloucester Basin in New South Wales. You know what? It's got a scale. Um, it's got sensible displacements on the faults. This is a pretty good cross-section. But nonetheless, this is the issue that the, uh, the public is concerned about is what happens to my asset, my near surface aquifer, uh, which might be a bore or a groundwater dependent ecosystem, and how is my gas development or coal development going to affect that near surface asset? Now notice the language asset, and that's effectively the way the regulator thinks of it. The near surface groundwater dependent ecosystem is the asset, and you have a resource you're trying to develop. We end up with a whole range of ways of thinking about fault seal, and those of you who've seen me talk before, this is a diagram I've been using now for 25 years. And effectively, it looks at the duality of how we expect faults to, to be leaking sometimes, sealing other times, have flow up and down them, um, and then the combination flow one, which isn't commonly thought about, about this low perm core and fracture transmissivity around the outside. And we've got a range of different algorithms we can use to try and understand that. Now, that, that multiplicity of thinking is across the board. Um, this is a really nice um, paper which goes through and looks at what the authors purport in their paper, what they suggest in their paper. And they're saying, well, look, are we seeing faults as being sealing as barriers, or are we seeing them as conduits, or are we seeing them as a combination? And, so it's, and then the Pearson regression, Structural geology and hydrocarbons, a lot of the literature reports that faults are barriers. Then when you go and have a look at tunneling and mining, um, you see that leaking is more common, especially in the tunneling. Now, there's a really good reason for that. They're concerned about people dying in their tunnels, and the people die in their tunnels because water inflow. So you can see we've got this whole range of different ways we're thinking about things. I really like to think about cognitive bias um, and what we can do on cognitive bias. So just to give you an example, these are ideas gained from looking at Claire Bond's work at the University of Aberdeen. We live in Australia. Um, we go to the beach, we take our kids to the beach. And what am I worried about? Am I worried about um, stingers? Am I running, worried about blue ring octopus? Or am I worried about a shark? So we can go and have a look at what the problems are. Of the 2,000 species of jellyfish, only about 70 of them actually harm people, and they very, very occasionally kill. Now, it's not nice. It's not a major life-threatening issue. Similarly, with sharks, we look at you know, 80 shark attacks a year and fewer than eight deaths a year. Now, you know, we have had a death off uh, Sydney just recently, and it is a traumatic and awful thing. 
but in the in the grand scheme of things, that's eight deaths a year in the world. So I'm worried about things. You know, could it be the blue ring octopus? Anyway, if you actually go and have a look at what the real risk is, it's the, the rip. The thing I didn't show you in here is this rip current. Same photograph, that's the rip current. And we have 21 people die a year in, on Australian rip currents. And we've known about this for a really, really long time. Here's something from the Sydney Morning Herald, 1938. You know, and this was the formation of the Surf Life Saving Organization. So when you go into the beach, it's not the shark, it's not the stinger, it's not the blue ring octopus. The thing we have to watch about is actually these things that are often, yes, you know, slightly hard to see, but once you get your head around it, you can see it. So cognitive bias is something we have to catch in ourselves all the time. So here's an example, I think, where we can look at cognitive bias. Work that GA's published, yeah, the report's great, the little cartoon that's in there, and they're looking at what the risks in the Surat of CSG development in the coal seams. They've got a fault, and they've got this flow going up the fault. Now, one of the things we have to really watch out about all of the discussions about faults and hydrogeology is, you know what, gravity's the only game in town. And if something's flowing up the fault, it needs a driving force. So the only way I can get a driving force is if here is higher, gives us head, and then it allows us to push up the fault. Faults strictly, you know, are just breaks in the rock. Now they've done a pretty good job. The, the fault has a sensible displacement in here. But you know what the one that's really interesting, and this is a bit like my rip, they've put in this other feature in here, which is a water bore. We've got a small number of faults out there that may be having a problem. We've got a huge number of water bores where gravity is being defied because we're pumping them. So if you sit there and look at the thousands of old bores with potentially rusting uh, casing, is that what the problem is or is it the faults? Actually cataloging that and working our way through that with stakeholders I think is a really important thing. Faults are seen as an unknown feature that we don't know about, and it's easy to go and put all our woo-woo magic into them and to say, oh, we don't know what's going on there. But let's go and actually look for the basic things that could be a problem. So one of the things you're gonna to have to do when you put your EIS together is you're gonna to have to deal with this concept of causal pathways. Fundamentally, um, they are a set of physical features that over time, allow for water to move around such that they damage an asset, roughly put. Your asset is the river, the groundwater dependent ecosystem, the near surface aquifer being used by farmers or stock and domestic use. That's what your asset is up in here. And as part of this causal pathway, you have to show that there will be damage to the groundwater dependent ecosystem. And that is a huge amount of biology and ecology that you have to get your head around, linked up with some complex groundwater flow modeling to then sit there and say, I've got a geometry of a fault that's a causal pathway. There is no way a fault can be a causal pathway. A fault is an element in a causal pathway, potentially. So I prefer to use the term potential flow pathway um, and then we really have to sit there and think about what's happening in terms of pressure and gravity because that's the thing that's going to drive this, this whole system. Go and have a look at them. Uh, as I said, I don't understand why we don't have a really clear definition of this and I hope that the regulator gets on and actually put, puts together something so that I can sit down at a farmer's picnic in the Hunter Valley and explain what a causal pathway is because just now people's eyes glaze over. So we're starting to think about faults. Here's a really nice fault that I've done a lot of work on in Miri and Sarawak, um, and this is what everyone thinks of faults. Now, it's important to take all the work we've been doing in the oil and gas industry uh, in rad waste and start to see how we can put it through to the groundwater. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of work on fault zones in, in the groundwater sphere. Um, Partly it's um, a business of people being, thing, feeling as though they're close to the surface. Well, you know what? I stand on this outcrop. A lot of the work that I've done on fault seal analysis for the oil and gas and rad waste industry has been based on outcrop analogs and looking at faults and systems in outlaw, outcrop. 
I don't think there's actually a really good excuse for groundwater not having done a better job on faults. So I'm going to go through what I think of the important bits of groundwater um, hydrogeology and where we have to do better. To do that, we'll, we'll borrow from the classic, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, all the displacement profile work. This is work that a fault analysis group did in the open cast coal mines in the UK and built up these models for sensible displacement profiles. This, I think, is the stuff that we really need to get into groundwater is sensible displacement profiles. Checking to see if we've got reasonable displacement profiles. Looking at my fault throw statistics. This is plotting up the length of the fault on here against the throw of the fault on a log look plot. The other one is going through and checking the dip of our faults. Have we got sensible families of dips? Coulomb failure criteria, quant continuum mechanics mean that faults form in sensible fashions. We cannot have 20 degree dipping normal faults unless we have excess pressure. There's a set of conditions that mean that these fault displacement geometries have to be respected. So the bad. The idea of having single permeability features for fault zone, I think is bad. Um, it's it's been quoted extensively in um, various um, documents and I think this idea that you have a fault with a single pro property because it comes from a basin is wrong. The other thing is the concept of using permeability to deal with fractures. Fractures do not have permeability, they have fracture transmissivity. We have to move away from using hydraulic conductivity and actually discretizing the fault into having the concept of fault rock permeability and fracture transmissivity. And it keeps being pushed around and, and, and this paper and, and then the uh, this other paper where faults are given a characteristic characteristics not on where they are in a basin but in terms of what the lithology is. I think they're incorrect and we know they're incorrect because there are lots and lots of papers out there that describe this. If you go and get yourself a fault in our crop you can go and have a look at how the matrix permeability and the fracture transmissivity vary. Here's an example um, from a, an outcrop very close to me. This is the Hawkesbury sandstone. This is the aquifer on top of the calcium gas development at, at Camden and the coal mines around near me. The people. This image is up on Gigapan, so if you don't like it, you can go and do your own interpretation. There's the data. You tell me I'm doing it wrong. This is a relatively small fault. So you can see I've gone in here as a structural geologist, and here's my foot wall. Here's my downthrown hang wall. I can trace through what my displacement on the fault is. Now the next thing I go through and do is say, well, these aren't homogeneous features. I can go through and define where are my aquitards and where are my aquifers and where are my fractures. And what I'm doing in here is I'm posting on this system and I'm showing you that there's heterogeneity in this system. Now if I take it to the next stage and I produce a static conceptual model of flow, I can start to say, well, given different pressure regimes, how would this perform? My aquitards are going to be no flow areas. I've got myself a reduced flow across the fault and I've got enhanced flow in and out of the page through fracture transmissivity. This is not a single fault with a single property. You actually need to go through and do the work. And we know how to do this. We've been doing this in the mining and oil and gas industry for, for hundreds of years, mapping out individual fault properties. We need to do it in hydrogeology and the excuse saying we don't have the data or it's too shallow doesn't wash. This is an outcrop of an aquifer very close to a mine and I, I did that work in an afternoon. Now we get to the ugly and I'm pulling out the ugly because this is where we've got stuff that is distinctly factually incorrect or where there's a deep cognitive bias. So again, this paper has been quoted widely um, uh, and this diagram and the idea of the diagram is that it puts a range of different uh, investigation techniques across a range of uh, length scales um, on a log plot, uh, breaking out in terms of whether they're geological or hydrogeological. Um, I guess the thing is, I don't understand how we can have hydrogeologists that aren't geologists. So it's super important that we actually have hydrogeologists who, who think geologically, because that's what you're dealing with. I can understand reservoir engineering, flow simulation, uh, 
completions of that being a different idea. But I tell you what, the oil and gas industry has done a fantastic job of having these reservoir engineers that are bloody good geologists. There's no reason why hydrogeology shouldn't be doing that. And frankly, from what we're seeing in the environmental impact statements, they're not doing a good enough job on that front. Uh, something as geologists, I think we really have to help work with to improve that. The biggest problem I got with this diagram, it, though, is the width of the fault core in here. And uh, fault cores are often thought to be these great big wide features that act as no flow boundaries. Well, when we actually go and have a look at it, and uh, there's a really good paper that Sylvia DeRosa, one of my PhD students, put together, go and have a look at that, where we show there are holes in fault rock every, uh, roughly every five meters. Well, I'm going to have a look at this and go and plot um, this diagram and we compare it against large data sets. So this is an assertion. Here is uh, Susanna Sperovic's um, data set from her PhD with Statoil Hydro. And you can see she's got a significant range of uh, throw versus um, fault rock thickness. The red bar is this range in here. And you can see that red bar is way out there. This is Conrad Child's paper from uh, Fault Analysis Group. And you can see again, the red bar is right in the tail of their distribution. Now remember, these are log log plots. So if you're in here, that's point that's point zero 0.01 to one meter. You know, the bulk of the data is down in there in the sub millimeter scale. And that's what Sylvia and, and uh, Zoe and I have found in these outcrops in Miri. The fault rocks are very, very thin. Bring up Donald Rumsfeld. No, no, it's not a particularly good time just now. Um, those who are looking back, um, we've got Russia sitting on the on the um, on the borders of uh, Ukraine, and Donald Rumsfeld was a, a, a real hawk for the um, Second Gulf War. And he was talking at this stage in this press conference about evidence for weapons of uh, mass destruction. Now, there's a lot I don't agree with this. But one of the things that he threw out there, which everyone thought was gobbledygook in the first place, I think is actually a, a, an idea that I really, really like. This is an example of me using somebody I don't admire their work. You know, and so there's lots of people I admire. I don't like your work. There's lots of people I don't admire. I do like the work and it's not a direct correlation. What Rumsfeld said in here is he said, well, look, we've got the known knowns the things we know we know, then there's the things we know we don't know, and then the unknown unknown. Now, I know that those fault rock thicknesses are unknown, and they're certainly not really, really thick. We have to be super careful not to mess up this bit of, of, of the philosophy. Catalog what you don't know, and don't try and guess it. Don't suggest that it's a known known. Because otherwise what's going to happen is a whole lot of people are going to go put their reservoir flow sim or their groundwater flow simulators with great big thick fault rocks. So the diagram obviously has utility. So I'm, I've had a go at trying to redraft it. And this is the two uh, diagrams put on top of each other. Um, to give you an idea, again, it's got that log scale of length. I've changed how uh, the disciplines um, and I'll just show you then just the single revised diagram. Added some colors in here. So effectively, black are things that are geological investigations. Licking rocks, hitting rocks, mapping, that sort of stuff. We've got geophysics, which I put in gray. So we've got various different forms of geophysics. There's another form of geophysics down in here. And then red, I've got the stuff where we're flowing, we're measuring permeability, we're actually getting flow proper properties. And then superimposed on that are uh, the flow features we're interested in. This is the aperture of a fracture, roughly. This is the thickness of fault rock, and that's very different from the original diagram. And then this is the width of a damage zone. You can see these things spread a significant number of order of magnitude. And just glibly putting in as one single parameter, you're going to get it wrong. Then what I've also put on top of this is, this is what I think I can actually know. This is my known knowns. I reckon I can get a pretty good idea about the fault throw. 
I can get a very good idea about the fault length. So length and throw are the things that I can actually do something about. Then I've got this thing in here, which is a, a fracture network. That one's fuzzy. And that's what a lot of the time we're seeing when we do a pump test or a slug test. We're seeing fracture transmissivity, not fracture permeability, not matrix permeability. We're generally seeing the fracture um, performance. And it's important to break these things out so we don't simplify this to an extent where we go, oh, I'm just going to put no flow boundaries in. So <clears throat> if I go to my known knowns, I'd sit there and say, well, these are the things I can actually do something with. Let's anchor ourselves on that. These things down in here, like they're useful and, and we have to do them, we have to understand them. But just now in terms of geology, these are the two things we can do stuff on. And you can see it's quite different from the original diagram. Yeah, again, I've broken this out and I'm saying, well, this is actually engineering. And to a large extent, this is engineering. This is geology and this is geophysics, if we're gonna break them. But I would sit there and say that there's a massive overlap between all these things. Um, but I'm still going to talk to a flow simulation engineer when I'm looking at a well test. I'm not going to give you a response on it. If I'm looking at geomechanics, again, I'm going to look for an engineer to understand the geomechanics, even though I'm conversant on it. So it's important that we recognize what we can and can't do. But across the board, I think we need to make sure we've got our faults, throws, and our fault displacements correct. We've got to take all these ideas and we've got to get them through to the regulator. And the regulator will want a traffic light solution. We know as geoscientists that we can't do that. Well, the only thing I know is I'm wrong. Coming up with a good, bad, you know, you can see it's been tricky with um, looking at the, the papers, but in terms of is that fault a good fault or a bad fault, I, you know, you're going to have to work with the idea that um, the regulator is going to want a traffic light red green solution. So as part of this, um, Bill and I have put together a workflow. Now the workflow looks as though it's tough, it looks as though it's arduous, and it, there is a fair bit of the kitchen sink in here. But I, I'm really happy with this workflow. I think it works. And in fact, I've just used it recently on a project. Um, and it's worth doing it because it means in the, as a geoscientist, I can actually explain to the flow modelers what I think in terms of the fracture flow. I can explain to the ecologists what I'm working on. And to a large extent, putting the temporal element of geology, how has this system eroded um, is a, a really important bit to it. So I recommend using a systematic approach and not just coming at the back end of this. What it seems is that, and again, this is a gross generalization, that we work out there is a resource there, whether it's gas or coal. We say, yeah, great, okay, no problem at all. We run around and we get that resource. And then we go to the regulator and say, well, hey, we want to do this. But we haven't got the baseline information. We haven't done the analysis of the overburden to better understand where we have faults, where we have groundwater dependent ecosystems, are they coincident? And a lot of the time, if we do this work early on, it m will make your EIS substantially cheaper. And you know what? I reckon it will also help to a large extent here with uh, issues of subsidence and uh, stakeholder engagement. If they can see us out there, walking country, mapping country, talking about the geology and the evolution, I don't think we're, gonna, we're far less likely to end up with this gas land scenario with a lot of disgruntled uh, stakeholders. Think about what work we're going to do. I'm putting forward a set of ideas about how we should characterize the faults. And I guess the first thing to do is to say, well, can I show that faults aren't important? Because if I can put together a really good piece of work and say, look, there are no faults in this region, then we don't have to worry about them. Then it's actually relatively simple. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not just a case of saying, you know, dip, 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 you know, I'm a good scout, I've done, you know, I said there's no fault. So I actually need to show it. And with that comes about our understanding about aquitards. So what, and this ties into this sort of second one that faults aren't important. What I can sit there and say, faults have uh, either not there, because I can show they're not there, it's billiard table flat, 
or my faults have displacement significantly less than the regional aquitard thickness. And that means I go through and actually work out where my aquitards are. And what I can do then is I can use fault statistics and isopacks of my aquitards and say, well, look, my faults, I'm going to displace it. So this is where using regional fault statistics, doing the basic work of looking at the outcrop data can really help you. Um, it's not hard. And I think there's a lot of cases we can actually go through and do this. So the second scenario is there are no regional aquitards. And so the faults are serving to enhance flow parallels the fault. What we're talking about here is we're talking about enhanced fracture network in the damage zone of the fault. So in that case, what we need to do is we need to go and look for all the outcropping faults and start to do some measurements, look at mechanical stratigraphy, uh, get us understanding about how flow is going on, the flow is um, happening in the damage zones. And this is a classic one to go and do interference tests along the fault not across the fault, along the fault. We're looking at the flow along the fault and we're trying to characterize how that enhances fracture flow. You're gonna to need to do discrete fracture network modeling, you're gonna need better flow modeling um, to try and integrate this enhanced flow. If you try and use hydraulic conductivity, you're gonna come unstuck because you've got these distinct features of fracture flow and matrix flow. How do my fractures and my damage zone drain and then how does the matrix drain into those fractures? The third scenario, and look, this is the most complicated one, and this is the one I don't think we're gonna to have to do very often. The one is I've got one or many aquitards, and those one or many aquitards are breached by faults. Um, and that means that the faults are displacing the aquitards. And in that case, you're gonna to have to come up with a really good three-dimensional model and you're gonna to need to have really good thicknesses of your aquitards and understand the thickness of the aquitards. And then you're gonna to need to build a set of juxtaposition diagrams or Allen diagrams to look at how this is gonna work. Now, I don't think this will happen very often, but it may. So it's important to have this as your last case. Um, hopefully the first two scenarios, you can sit there and say, well, I'm somewhere between here and here. I'm somewhere between scenario one and scenario three. I'm most likely scenario one or I don't have an aquitard, so I'm definitely not in, in scenario three or scenario one. So it's allowing us to break out what work we need to do. So I'm gonna give you some examples about where this is. We can use fault analysis, where it's gone right and where it's gone wrong. Um, this is just on the edge of the Liverpool Plains near the Pilliga. Um, and um, as you can see, the locals don't really want Santos and, and the coal seam gas development at Narrabri. Um, I spend a lot of time in this part of the world because my um, wife's family live across the top of this range over here. So I spend a lot of time with farmers talking about this stuff. Thus, when I can't explain it to really super smart farmers, I know we've got a problem here. And uh, you know, if I've insulted people along the way, it's because I've had to explain things repeatedly. So to give you an idea about uh, the Narrabri area, um, it's up here in, in uh, northern central New South Wales, or they call it central New South Wales, but you can see it's actually northern eastern New South Wales, there's a lot more to the west. Um, and the area of interest that uh, Santos are looking to develop is this area in here in the Pilliga State Forest, and it's cut out around a set of agricultural land in the around the Namoi River. Now, part of the reason why I started doing this, A, I was up there in the area, um, but this paper came out, um, and even though there's a lot of respect for the work on methane sniffer work, there seemed to be a classic case of faults being brought in as the boogie monster, as the thing that's out there that could cause the problem. And you can see in this visual uh, um, abstract, faults are inferred in here, <clears throat> in the base, in, in from the coal measures, into what's referred to as the, as the Great Australian Basin sediments. Um, that's effectively the Pilliga, um, and then the Namoi uh, alluvium. But these faults have no displacement. 
the one thing we know about a fault, the one, the only thing that defines what a fault is, it has demonstrable, measurable displacement. We might not know what the displacement is because of the erosion, but we can demonstrate that we've got carboniferous fault against Precambrian. We can sit there and say it's got 25 meters throw on it, but a fault has to have displacement. Any diagram, any paper that has faults in there has to show that faults exist with sensible displacement. Otherwise, you're in that type one scenario where, hmm, I have no faults, so I don't need to worry about faults. Well, I sat and thought, well, rather than you know, doing nothing about this, um, let's put a paper together. So Bill and I have put a paper together, published at Apia, that you can have a look at this. Santos have done a reasonably good job in their original EIS. They've got this cartoon cross-section. And I guess one of the criticisms in here is that I would much prefer to see proper scale cross sections that I can measure stuff off. It gives me confidence when I'm going and talking to people that here is a cross section of what's underneath your farm. And it's not too hard to do. Nonetheless, the section does show we've got coal measures with an unconformity from the Permian coal measures into the Triassic sitting above it. And then we've got the Pilliga sitting on top of that. And this is referred to as the GAB. How it's connected to the GAB or not is another matter. The rocks are deemed to be GAB rocks, um, which I think is sloppy terminology. The thing that we're having a look at in here, and Santos are great in that they have actually gone through and said, where are their aquitards in the system relative to their coal measures? And so they're marking where the aquitards are and they give indicative thicknesses. So the game here is, are those aquitards thick enough that I don't have to worry about faults. So go through and have a look again at their reports and you can see that the, the main shale that they're talking about in here is the Napaby shale and it's 140, mean 141 meters thick. Uh, and then if I add the Napaby and Digby, which are these two here, we get ourselves 173 meters of thickness. So that means to have a fault that displaces all of that, I need to be, have a displacement of more than 173 meters. All this information sits out there in the public domain. Bit of a magical mystery tour going around and having a look at these rocks. Um, this is the Pilliga sandstone in here. This is what it looks like an outcrop and you can see it's not particularly good farming country. Um, it is where we've got significant amount of recharge um, in the system and it tends to be sitting up proud. What's interesting is we're actually standing on the Napa V. So in general, the farming country is on the aquitards. This is the Pulawale. Um, again, I had to hunt around a lot to find it in outcrop, but I could find an outcrop. I went and found some road cuts, and you can see that often the aquitards aren't well exposed because they weather easily, so you need to find a road outcrop or similar to, or a quarry. But you can see this is a very fine grain, low permeability set system, it's not going to have uh, extensive fracturing through it. And then the next one down is the Napa Bee. Again, I had to be creative to go and try and find the Napa Bee. Um, this is in the National Park, uh, so I didn't take any samples. Um, the volcanics sitting on top of it, and the volcanics in this road cut have preserved this very friable, fragile system. Nonetheless, this is a fantastic aquitard, and so the problem in outcrop is that most of the farmers have ploughed this up. You know you're on Napa Bee because the farmers have put surface dams in. Um, aquitards are the things that you put dams on. The water goes into your dam and it doesn't leak out the bottom. You don't find dams in uh, outcropping aquifers. The Digby <clears throat> is the base of the Triassic section. So the Napa Bee and Digby are the, tr the Triassic sediments. And what's interesting about this is that that Triassic set of sediments are the aquitard for where I am down here in the Southern Highlands, right the way up to the Galilee. Um, this Napa Bee Digby um, is the Narrabeen group down here where it's dominantly marine. Here, the Digby, there's um, there tend to be more conglomerates than grading up to being lacustrine. And then when you get up to look at the Rewan up in the Galilee and Bowen, it's purely um, lacustrine. But fundamentally, you've got a bunch of volcanoclastics filling the accommodation space. 
and that means that the coal can't be accumulated. And these what kind of clastics, lacustrine marine uh, dominated systems form the aquitards. And you can see, again, we're in a quarry with a dam. Effectively, the quarry is holding water. So we've got a pretty good idea that this is a, a reasonable aquitard, even though it looks reasonably coarse grained. So thanks to the guys at Sequent, um, they lent me a copy of uh, Lipfrog, and it was incredibly easy to make a three-dimensional model with a bunch of data I typed in from the ge geological survey. I got the um, digital terrain model from um, Elvis, federal government um, topographic uh, data server, and surface outcrop data from um, New South Wales Geologic Survey. Government departments here provide us so much really good data. It, it's so useful building these models. So the model is driven from outcrop geometry, and that outcrop geometry with the topography allows us to get these windows that gives us a really good idea about how the system's working. This model has five times vertical exaggeration on it, and you can see it's just a gently dipping base of the uh, base of my Triassic. There is no way I can put a 175 meter throw fault in here. It's relatively simple to show. Now, I wasn't paid to do this. Bill and I did this as a paper for Apia. Um, you know, it took us a little bit of work, and the guys at Sequent were very kind to lend us the software, but literally anyone can do this from the open source data. The Santos environmental impact statement, they've done the right thing. They've published a depth structure contour map here, which has faults on it, and it posts the data sources. This map is uncommon in the environmental impact statements I've looked at, and I've looked at a lot recently. They show what the fault displacements are, they show where the data is. From this, we can, we've got a rough idea about what the maximum displacement of the faults are, and we can go through and show that these faults are substantially smaller displacement than the thickness of the Napa B uh, and Digby. This would actually be the sort of piece of work that you would do to show how to deal with there being an absence of faults. So, <clears throat> to quote Greta, blah, 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 blah. Now, I feel as though I've been saying this now for the last 25 years. This, these ideas and techniques are exactly the stuff that Alan Gibbs was having me force down people's throats in the 1990s and exactly the same things in the 1990s I was dealing with and working on the British Nuclear Waste Program. We actually have to buck up and we have to change. We have to actually improve our basic work um, and we have to improve it quickly. Um, now there's not a lot I agree with necessarily with Greta, but I do agree that there is some urgency to this. If we want to do things right, we have to do them better and we have to do them quicker. So why do we care? Now this is the fundamentals of it. Do I get paid? Is that all that matters? Or is there something else? If we're working in groundwater, CO2, toxic and rad waste, we've got regulators. We're working in the regulatory environment. And as I said, the regulators aren't always necessarily going to be the best people to help us. If you look at the Gaslands movie, the biggest problem they had was with the regulator. And we need to help them as an industry do the best job they can. It's different if you're working in oil and gas. Like if we get it wrong, the share price goes up and down. It's between you and your boss. Uh, you and your boss and your boss's boss with the share market. You know, this is the sort of thing that if you drill a dry well, no one dies, somebody loses some money, and you go through because the advantage in the future could be so good. If we get it wrong with carbon capture and storage, if we get it wrong with groundwater and, and rad waste, we're gonna have a an issue with the regulator and society. So I think we need to help the regulator do a better job. This independent work, making sure we can verify and show our working is essential for the future trust. If I want to go onto somebody's property to go and do some work, to go and do some research, I want them to trust me. I want to know that I and all my colleagues have actually done a good job. And we actually have to help the hydrogeologists do a better job. Make sure that they have faults that make sense. Make sure they have stratigraphy that makes sense. Use sequence stratigraphy. Make sure that they go through and have sensible displacements across their faults and thickness changes. That's what we're going to have to work forward as an industry. And it's from that subsurface working as a resource 
um, through to then how we change that to being a reserve through the environmental impact statement. That's where as subsurface professionals we need to really help. So <clears throat> to quote the great luminaries, the Spice Girls, this is what I really, really want. And it's not that hard and we can all do it. What I really want to see in environmental impact statements are decent cross sections that you can measure, that you know what the scale is. This is a cross section that Dick Glenn from when he was working at the Geological Survey in uh, the Hunter Valley. This was done in pencil and paper in the 1980s. We used to be able to do this. We need to do it again. We need to produce good geologic cross sections. We need to work on aquitards, not just the aquifers. This is some core that um, Wendy Tim's organized to be um, uh, acquired at Thelmere Lakes that Tim McMillan and I and Wendy worked on. We were looking at how that aquitard could um, impact the lakes and nearby coal mining and, coal, and potentially coal seam gas. Good hard work on aquitards. We then need to describe all our information in easy fashion so everyone can, can measure and see and use it. Tabulate your data, provide thicknesses, properties of aquifers and aquitards. Again, not hard. A lot of it's going to be in the public domain, so just make it easy for everyone to do. We need to see more geophysics. Some fantastic work that Ken Laurie did when he was at Geoscience Australia. Uh, this is Airborne Electromagnetics, the Broken Hill Manage Aquifer Recharge Project. In orange here, we can see the Blanchetown um, Claystone. That's an aquitard formed um, when Lake Bungunya formed. The Murray River got dammed, we ended up with a lacustrine environment, and about 40 to 70,000 square kilometers of lake formed. In there, something like 15 meters thick of this claystones formed. We can go through and look at it, and there's some been fantastic work done on that. But you can see what I've done is I've drawn you together a story about what that reflector in the geophysics looks like. In oil and gas industry, we've been really good at using sequence stratigraphy and geophysics to help pull together a story. I think we really need to help the hydrogeologists take this geophysical data and pull it together to, into a sequence stratigraphic story. Using a airborne electromagnetics, I cannot iterate enough, is so useful. You don't need to be on the ground. It's something you can acquire of a large area outside your lease. It's done from a helicopter and it gives you a really good understanding about the regional geology. And in particular, it tells you about what's conductive and what isn't conductive, what's flowing and what isn't flowing. So this can be really useful. With all this information coming through with good regional fault statistics, what's my faulting style? What's my fault architecture? What's the anatomy of my faults? And please, you know, support a good Aussie company. Petrosys make fantastic mapping software show your maps so you can count the contours with sensible displacement profiles showing where your drill hole data is where your seismic information is where your electromagnetics where your outcrop this is not rocket science this is good old-fashioned techniques if we put these in the eis then it means that we can all check each other's work and then finally if you need to and this is only going to be in the really last case draw allen maps i hope that we get very few of these produced because we've done all the rest of this really well. So as you can see, what I'm asking for here in, in the EIS isn't necessarily rocket science. It's all relatively achievable. Um, now, if I've upset anyone by being you know, tough on them, as I said, there's no statute of limitations on any of our work. Uh, we're scientists. I would argue that scientific consensus is the last thing we need. We need good, skeptical, robust um, peer review of all of our work. Please, please, please tell me when I've screwed up because that's the only way we're going to get on with things. Anyway, hopefully there's questions. Um, put them through on the um, in underneath. Uh, it may well be that if I've insulted enough people, we can get together a... Uh, talk afterwards where we can uh, record um, people giving me the criticism face to face which would be fantastic. Anyway I hope you've enjoyed this. I've certainly enjoyed the work and I'm looking forward to turning up at the farmers picnics and 
being able to give people a really, really good story. Cheers.